So we are setting off and, and continuing our journey through the Bible this year in 2021. Uh, we are into Proverbs this week. Uh, we actually got into a little bit of it last week. We're picking up with chapter 4 this morning. And my sermon today is on spiritual parenting. Pastor Mark Lohman was the first pastor who took an interest in my spiritual growth. I'm going to take a minute because I haven't seen him since this summer. This, is, this was my pastor, the last pastor that we had when we were living in Michigan. So it's been a, a, a decade, really, since we've been under his shepherding. But I, just a quick back, very quick backstory was that we, uh, Emily and I, shortly after we got married, we made the decision to chart our own course when it came to, to church. We had a church where my parents attended, and we had a church that I had grown up in, a separate church, and neither of them felt quite right for us. And so we took a leap of faith, or a step of faith, and attended a church that we had never set foot in before. And I remember the first Sunday that I was there, I prayed shortly before we went to worship that God would provide an avenue for me to do a one-on-one -on -one study with the pastor. Now, I'd never met the man before, and I should clarify also that I am a person who learns and grows deeply by reading, that is, and, and by study and engagement. So that first Sunday, we went to church and I left, as we exited the building, really knowing very few people, there were a few people that I did know from other specs of, spectrums of life, but I stopped and the pastor greeted me and I asked him, Mark, do you have something that I can go through? I'm feeling very dry in my spiritual life right now. And he said, you know what, I have just the thing. Hang on a minute and I'll come back and bring it to you. And, I, and, and as he walked away, I thought, Aaron, you had the perfect opportunity to finish that sentence and ask him to do it with you. So he comes back a few minutes later with the material that he had for me, and he handed it to me, and he gave me, again, another opportunity to ask him to journey with me, but I chickened out. So I turned and started to walk away, and he said, hang on a second. How would you feel about doing this as a one-on-one -on -one study? And so we met for an entire school year's time every week before school. And I'll tell you what made this, this time even more treasured as I look back is that that last year, this happened during the last year we were in Michigan, and that year was a very tremendously challenging year, especially the end of it for Emily and I, because that led to the challenges of having to move to a new location, the loss of jobs and everything that came with it. But through all of this, I was prepared for much of what you would often say you can't possibly be prepared for. Now, I ran into Mark. We usually try to make it a yearly ritual that when we go back to Michigan, I like to spend a little bit of time with him. Well, it just didn't work this year. But as we were leaving a restaurant in town, I see him and his wife, God's providence at work, walking down the street. And much to Emily's chagrin, because we had pictures to take, I said, i got to stop and talk to him. And so we pulled up alongside of him and conversed for a quite a period of time, but one thing struck me that I feel compelled to share because it fits so closely with what we're going to talk about this morning. He said, Aaron, are the people there growing in conformity to Christ? Because if they are not growing more and more into the likeness of Christ, then your work is of no value. That is where it is at. That every day, even from the moment that you are saved, every day we are called to live towards conformity to the image of Christ. And that does not happen in a vacuum by yourself. And so with that said, let's dig in here today about spiritual parenting. 
So Mark, in this case, and he invited me into his life. He mentored me. But not only did he invite me into his life for one hour a, a week, he invited Emily and I into their lives throughout the week as well. We were in a small group with them. We had opportunities to engage them. And I have absolutely no doubt that if we had had kids at the time, that they would have invested very dearly into them as well. But Mark, for me, was a spiritual father. He was really the first primary spiritual father that I had. But he was someone who came alongside me and intentionally walked through faith with me. He was helping me to learn how to better study the Bible, how to pray, and he was an encouragement, especially during those dark months towards the end of, of March back in 2011. And so the terms that we may use, or I may use, would be to say that Mark discipled me. Now, if you could have that, a relationship with men, if you could have that, a relationship with another godly man or women, if you could have a relationship like that with a godly woman to come and to mentor you and to disciple you and to encourage you and challenge you and train you, would you take them up on it? Now, this person could be older. Mark's considerably older than I am. But it might also be someone that's younger than you. It does not have anything really to do with age. But it has everything to do with spiritual maturity. It isn't that Mark had it mastered. In fact, he would tell you that he, even at his age, he just retired recently from a lifetime spent in the pulpit, he would tell you there are still things that he learns every day when he digs into the Word. So he doesn't have it mastered. He doesn't have it all together. But what he had that he could offer me was that he had walked the spiritual path before that I was on. And so he had the experience to be able to say to me, here is what you need when you are feeling hopeless, or here is what you need when you are having questions in life, or here is just some encouragement that, you know what, you may not be feeling real great about yourself or maybe your relationship with God, but be encouraged that I see some of those fruits in you that have been born. Now, in a spiritual parenting relationship, in this discipleship relationship, it is you have a spiritual parent, and you, by, as a byproduct, you have a spiritual child. Both roles are equally vital. And it is not just an information download. So Mark didn't just come to me and download a bunch of information to me and say, there you go, have at it. Part of the, a big part of the process is, you learn some things and then you try it. You experience. You learn what works and what doesn't work. You learn to test things against Scripture. What is truth and what is not? What are the things that I have heard about out in the world that sound like good, valuable advice, but then I realize as I try them out that this is not <coughs> biblical in nature. It is life on life. You've maybe heard that phrase spoken from others before. Discipleship is life on life. Now today in Proverbs chapter 4, we find an actual biological father, Solomon, who is also the spiritual father to his son. So he's actually playing both roles. Now this is not always the case. You may have had a biological father or mother, depending on your role, who didn't take their responsibility as a spiritual parent seriously. They left, maybe they left it up to the church, or maybe they just said, you know, I'm deviating from the path of faith, so I'm not going to, I've, I've removed myself from that responsibility. I'm not responsible. Although the Bible is clear that the primary trainers of one's children are their parents. 
But in the, on the other hand, you may not have had a biological parent who did the spiritual labors. And so uh, you may have someone who is invested. I pray that you have all had someone that's invested dearly into you spiritually in your growth who's discipled you even if they were not a parent. And that's what I found with Mark. But again, in this story today, we find someone who played well both roles. And we find that the reason he turned out this way, interestingly enough, is that Solomon points back that he had a spiritual father as well that was his biological father. So let's read the text here. We're going to go through a bunch of it, but here are just a few verses to start. He says, Listen, my sons, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. I give you sound learning, so do not forsake my teaching. For I, too was a son to my father, still tender and cherished by my mother. Now my sermon in the sentence, my summary statement for today is this. Discipleship is when one person pours God's words and ways, his God's wisdom, into another person to help them know and follow Christ. And that that person pours that wisdom into another person, another generation, and so on, and so on. Like the centurion story we read about in Sunday school this morning, the centurion came to faith, but it didn't end there. The centurion then had the opportunity to continue to share his faith with those around him. That's three generations in this story of discipleship. And that's three ways, three generations where there was faithfulness to studying God's words and his ways. So the question again is, do you want a spiritual father or a spiritual mother? Do you want to be discipled, to be trained? Now this is not, sometimes I'll admit I pose some theoretical questions, rhetorical questions that I'm not looking for an answer for. And I'm not asking for an answer this second from you. But I'm asking each one of you, if you do not have a spiritual father or a spiritual mother in your life, I don't care if you're 15, if you're 30, if you're 80, it doesn't matter. Pray about it this week. If you have the opportunity to be a spiritual parent, which we'll talk what that looks like here shortly, take the opportunity to do so. Invest in the lives of those around you. And I'll tell you this, if you come back at the end of next week and you say, I really want to have a spiritual parent, but I don't know where to start, then we'll work to help find someone that would be a good match for you. It's that important. But if you can think of someone, and I've said this before. Don't wait. Go ask them. Make a phone call after church if it's not someone that's sitting in this room. Or if it's someone that you know could use some growing in their faith, invite them into a relationship of spiritual mentorship as well. And do it regularly. Because the point is we all need discipleship in order to grow. And so first, my first point this morning is that each one of us needs a spiritual father or spiritual mother. Now, in your reading, again, how I'm preaching through this, you're not getting every single verse and chapter from me, but you're getting snippets, and hopefully you're reading through the, te the whole text. But what we see throughout the book of Proverbs is that a father is writing to a son. This is not just some theoretical writing. These are actual sons, an actual son that he is writing to. But in verse 1 here, it says he's writing to sons, plural. Now, we may not make too much of it, but clearly he's expecting this teaching to go to more than just his son. Maybe to several of his sons, 
But there's an expectation that what it is that he has to teach from God will multiply. It will go out. He expects it to go to his sons. He expects it to go to his son's sons and his son's son's sons and so forth. And to his daughters. Again, when I say sons, you, you women out there are not excluded from this. This goes for women as well. He expects his teachings to take root in them so much that they will go and do the same. They will reproduce these spiritual teachings in their children as well. And they may not even be their biological children. It may be a neighbor's child, or it may be a friend of one of your kids, or it might be someone with whom you come into contact with through work. But there are people, and every one of us needs a disciple maker and someone to help us to grow and someone to help grow. Now this role is for everyone, but part of what I'm going to focus on today as well is the family mandate. That is, that those, you know, for my kids, I and Emily are to be the primary caretakers. But as I speak a little bit to parents today as well, realize that we are all in that camp of even if you don't have, maybe you've never had children or you don't have children that are in the home or maybe they're far away, you are not excluded from this call to help train each other. So Proverbs chapter 1 verse 8 says, Listen, my son, to your father's instructions and do not forsake your mother's teachings. Now, as I've already said, God has called us dads and moms to be the first ones to teach our kids the words from Scripture as well as the way, the path to Jesus Christ. When we get to our meeting time today, and it won't be the only time I talk about this, but I'm going to be introducing a one pathway, a pathway that we're going to set off as a church towards intentional discipleship because one of the things I have learned is that very few in in generations that we live in have been intentionally trained I hear a lot of parents talk about well, we did a lot of informal things but we never actually really did any training when it came to scripture to doctrine I remember as a kid going to church and you hear a lot of doctrine based messages and and growing up, as I got older, I went to a lot of churches where doctrine was almost completely left out of the teaching. It became, you see this more and more in churches where things have become more and more me-focused, more and more watered down, and we need some of those foundations in us. Because, frankly, I attribute a lot of the fact, the divisions in the churches that we see to the fact that doctrine has been minimized in many places, and been replaced with this me-centered style of worship. And what can I get out of this? But we need relational environments for this to happen. And so when you hear me get passionate in about, an, in about a half an hour, 45 minutes, about these growth groups, these small groups, understand that growth comes in that setting. Growth as is necessary, doesn't happen completely on a Sunday morning worship service like this. This is great. This is a great way to gather together in corporate worship of, of God. But this is not an avenue. You know sitting here, you've, been, you've all been in classrooms before, and you know that where the best learning and growing takes place is when you have to get your hands into it and get your feet and your eyes, your whole self invested into the process. And so, while we believe that parents are the primary people, there are others who are called into that role. But we must take seriously our faith and the faith of those who have come behind us as well. I once heard it said, the things that you learn with regard to God are not about, they are not for you, they are for the ones that you will teach that come behind you. So if you say, I remember complaining to my parents once when I, when I was a teenager, saying, Mom, Dad, I've heard this message a hundred times. 
why do I need to hear this again? And I was focused entirely on my consuming nature of the word rather than saying, what am I to do with this word? What am I to do with what is being taught to me? Now let's continue in our verses, verses 4 and 5. Solomon writes, Then he, my father, taught me and said, Take hold of my words with all your heart. Keep my commands and I and you will live. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Do not forget your words or turn away from them. So here is a father, Solomon. He's known as the wisest man who ever lived. But here he is quoting his father and saying, this is what you are to do. Now, all of us, our first tendency is to copy those who are dearest and closest. So that means most of us tend to be duplicates to a degree of our parents. Now, there are certainly things that you may look back and say, well, I chose to do the opposite of what my parents did because I didn't like it. But the reality is, is that most of you if I lined you up next to your parents and, or we had separate conversations even and then we talked about it, you'd see a lot of commonality because that's our nature. And so as a parent, that strikes tremendous fear, godly fear in me, that I need to be responsible with what God has given me. And that we need to be responsible with what God has given us here as a body of Christ. If we're not reading the word, if we're not praying with one another, who's going to do it? I see a lot of, and I am guilty of this at times in our own home, of this do what I say, not what I do mentality. But it should be, do what I say and what I do. And so if you are a parent, again, primarily to those of you that are parents right now or are going to be parents in the years to come, actively teach your children wisdom. And if your kids come around every so often, that doesn't end, does it? They could be 30 years old. They could be 70 years old. They could be whatever age, and there's still a need for each of us to hear and receive more wisdom. Verse 6, do not forsake wisdom, and she will protect you. Love her, and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom, though it costs all you have. Get understanding. Cherish her, and she will exalt you. Embrace her, and she will honor you. She will give you a garland to grace your head and present you with a glorious crown. And the the message that the Father is giving here is really simple. Don't overcomplicate it here. He said, seek to understand what the scriptures are telling you and then live it. Wisdom will keep you out of the way of a lot of unnecessary trouble. Wisdom will help you Find the right path and will reward you. Now, does that mean that it's smooth sailing? I can bet I can get an amen that the answer is no. It doesn't mean that we're going to have smooth sailing. But it will guide you away from many things that will cause you or could cause you years, if not lifetimes, of suffering unnecessarily. And not only is he doing this, now Solomon is taking the responsibility. It isn't just my message. This message was given to me by my father to give to my sons. And it is given to my sons so that they, in turn, may give it to their sons. So let's get more to this, what I've already kind of hinted at. What about if we don't have kids in this capacity? Maybe we've never had kids Or maybe our kids are so far away that meeting and doing stuff regularly just isn't practical. What does this look like? And again, I emphasize, no matter what age you are, God can provide you with someone to help train you and encourage you along the way. Think about the relationship that Paul had specifically with Timothy. Now, he had a number of 
discipleship relationships, but I want to focus on Timothy for just a second. Now, depending on how much you know about Timothy, uh, he had a Christian mother and a grandmother who were commended for their faith, that he learned the faith through his mother and grandmother. That's the primary source. But we also learn in 2 Timothy chapter 1 that he needed Paul in his life. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, it says, You then, my son, this is Paul writing to Timothy, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. You see, Paul became a spiritual father to, to Timothy. But not only that, he expected very clearly Timothy to become a spiritual father to men and women of the church that he would eventually pastor. To pass along the teachings of Jesus Christ. So I say again, who is your Paul? Who is your Timothy? Because we need, we should get one of these at least. Now I'm going to say, don't try to be like Jesus. Don't go after 12. 12 might seem, oh, if Jesus did 12, that seems like a good number. I'm telling you right now, if you want to invest in a way that's of value and of substance, go for one. Focus on one. Go deep. Invest in that person. Let them invest in you. We all need a spiritual father and mother. And I'll tell you, it takes discernment and prayer. Because there are a lot of people, I'll speak from my own experience, there are a lot of people right now in my life, both in and outside the church, that I think, I could do this, I could disciple him, 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 him. And it becomes a matter of prayer. God, who have you placed on my heart? God, who have you positioned in a way that you can, that their hearts are prepared and they are desiring this. That it is a process of reproducing. Now years ago, when I was a child, I went and volunteered for Habitat for Humanity. And uh, that day, there was a man named John, and he oversaw the work. Now John had a lot of experience in construction. He was retired and had volunteered with Habitat for a number of years and worked on many houses. And so he taught me how to properly drill a hole into the cement so that we could install a sub pump. So he showed me. First, he didn't let me do any of it. He showed me how to do it. He explained it to me. And then he gave me the opportunity to do so while he watched, and he gave me tips and pointers and wisdom as to what needed to be, how I needed to adjust what I was doing. And after I had a good understanding of what to do, he got up and left and moved on to another task. And before long, a couple hours later, Matt showed up. He had just been upstairs finishing doing some work, and I said, Matt, how would you feel about coming and helping me? Well, Matt had no experience, and so I gave him the training with which John had told me just a few hours before. And so then Matt picked it up. And as Matt started to do this and started to understand it, I said, Matt has got this under control. I'm going to move myself to another area. And then Jim shows up, and Matt shows Jim how to do it. He tells him, and then he lets Jim do it with some wisdom, some advice, some pointers, and then this progresses. And I have no doubt that had someone else come, Jim would have done the same. This is what it means to do discipleship. First, I learn, then I pass along then I allow space for them, the mistakes that happen in life to happen, the growth to happen, and then we gradually remove ourselves 
from the picture. We let them fly. We talk about this with kids all the time. We've got to let their wings go out and let them soar. And sometimes those eagles' wings take some take toll. They, they maybe have a crash landing here or there. They get injured. And so you're there. You're always there to help be a, a sounding board, a help, but you also have turned them loose in a way that they can fly and teach others to do the same. But instead of drilling holes into cement, we are to be drilling the truths of Scripture deep into human hearts. And sometimes human hearts can be harder than concrete. No, discipleship is not clean. It's not easy. It would be a whole lot easier if we could just kind of leave, keep to ourselves. You know, I'll focus on my faith. You do your faith. You do you. I'll do me. You believe what you want to believe. I'll believe whatever I want. We'll just we'll sit in a we'll sit in a building once a week together, and we'll call ourselves a body. But I think Jesus wanted so much more. I think He's called us to so much more. Discipleship is about the people. It's about compassion and caring and and a desire to see one another grow up in the faith. So that as I've heard others, even in this building, say to me. Our faith is built on the shoulders of spiritual giants that have come before us. Whether you think of yourself as a spiritual giant or not, well, the only way you'll ever get to that place is if you spend your lifetime devoted to God. But it is so important. And secondly, we all need a spiritual father or mother who helps us find wisdom. Now, once again, here in Proverbs, we are given two options, two choices. You've got to, you can either live a foolish way, or you can live the way of the wise. I love Proverbs for that. It's, it's this or this. It's cut and dry. It isn't, well, this, 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 or this. It's this or this. It's very simple. Proverbs picking up in verse 10. Listen, my son, and accept what I say, and the years of your life will be many. Instruct you in the way of wisdom and lead you along straight paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hampered. When you run, you will not stumble. Hold on to instruction. Do not let it go. Guard it well, for it is your life. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked or, the way, or, the, or walk in the way of evildoers. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn from it and go on your way. For they cannot rest until they do evil. They are robbed of sleep till they make someone stumble. They eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. Now, if this passage sounds at all familiar, again, I didn't preach on this, but in chapter 3, there are some similarities. In chapter 3 of Proverbs, Solomon contrasts these two paths of wisdom and of folly. And he calls his son to listen well and to hold on to the instruction that he's been given. But this just isn't just some any instruction. It's instruction that is grounded in the word. He was told, study all of the Hebrew scriptures available. And we are in the same way told to, to uh, study all of the scriptures today with Berean-style diligence. Dig in. Dig in again. And so if you want to, to gain wisdom, it's found in reading Scripture and in living it out. Now, years ago, I used to know some very, very basic sign language uh, to the song, Jesus Loves Me. Now, when you sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, the sign for Bible is signing Jesus, which is touching the nail marks on your palms, or I'm sorry, touching where the nail marks were, and then putting your palms together, and then opening them up like a book. The Bible is Jesus' book. But notice that when you sign Jesus' book, you have to open it for it to be a book. You don't finish by keeping your palms closed, it is opened up. God's will 
will be without power in our lives if we never open it. So what would your sign for Bible be if I asked you to show it? Would it be open or would it be closed? Let's open God's word. As I've called you again this year to do so that we can guide our family. Because the reward is that if our children choose to walk in it, they will be protected from wickedness. But not only that, any who choose to walk in wisdom will walk in the path of light and righteousness. In verse 18, we read that the path of righteousness is like the morning sun, shining ever brighter till the fullness of the full light of day, but the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. The word stumble is used three times here to describe the way of the foolish. There's only pain that way. And I've seen it play. I'm going to go this way because it seems right to me. And, and, and my parents would say, no, there's only pain that goes down that path. I've walked that path before. And like so many others in this life, you know what, Mom and Dad? Let me just do it my way. I'm sure that it will be different for me. Because this is a different generation. These are different times. Surely we've learned new things. And I'm smart enough, you know, as we like to say, as teachers like to say about teenagers. They think they've got the world by the tail. They think they have every answer, and they know it all. But in the end, it leads to pain. And there's a close connection between wisdom and the tangible, tangible physical world, which I will close with this morning. That is, that wisdom itself, while it is spiritual, it's not abstract. There is physical manifestations with wisdom that play out. And so I'm going to close here. I'm going to read the rest of Proverbs 4, and then I'm going to close with things that are important for you to take home with you today. It says, My son, pay attention to what I say. And before I finish, please focus as I read on the different body parts, if you will, that are referred to, and then I'll get into that more. How What he says, So my son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. Keep your mouth free of perversity. Keep corrupt talk from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the paths for your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or to the left, but keep your foot from evil. So we hear a lot, I and mean, there's a, a, a lot of them. I'll expect someone afterwards can tell me how many there were. I didn't count them all up. But a number of references. And so I want to hit with this, so with the ears. Okay. How do we help with our ears in this life? It is that we want to, we need to protect ourselves from gossip. If someone comes to you and starts to talk to you negatively about someone else, you need to be able to say, stop, is this, and ask yourself, is this gossip? Because if it is, this is not for me. I'm going to, in that situation... Seek to bring out some positives in here because I don't want to hear secondhand what's going on with so and so over here. Protect your ears from this. Be a person of encouragement. With your eyes, we need to guide our eyes from the entertainment with which we watch that fill our sights with uh, and fill our sights with God's creation, with God's family that he has blessed us with and with God's beauty. So that might mean turning off some Netflix show or skipping it altogether. It might mean going outside or inviting your neighbors to come over and have 
conversation and grow in relationship with them. It might mean that you're in the midst of a series and all of a sudden you realize something comes up, like, man, this might not be the best thing for me to watch. And it might be, you know, what? I'm really curious about what's coming, but I'm unwilling to allow this to continue because I am seeing um, some issues with what is in this show or movie. With our bodies, we are to protect ourselves from laziness and gluttony, but to fill ourselves with good foods and with diligence. So that might mean getting up from a day where ah, I just really, just, you know, it's Saturday and it's my day off and I just want to sit down and relax and do absolutely nothing. Or you've had a long week and you get a call that says, you need, I need you to go do this. And every fiber in your body says, no, I don't have it in me. But you realize there's something greater here that needs to be done. That you, you labor on for God's glory. With our mouths and lips, we want to also, just as we want to not be receivers of gossip, we need to be careful about spreading of gossip or of lies that may easily come. There's nothing one likes to share more in this world than gossip. Over and over and over again. But instead, fill your mouth with grace, with truth, with encouragement. So I give you something practical right now. Who is it today that you can go to and give an encouraging word? Who is it that you can tell you know what, I really appreciate this about you. We want to protect our feet. We want to avoid from walking ourselves into situations of temptation. But instead, using our feet to provide us a, a vehicle, if you will, to helping those in need. Or to go with your feet to spread the good news of the gospel. And finally, your heart. Your heart is the center of your identity. And that we must guard the core of our identity very dearly. Because when your heart is seared, there are many things, you know, we, we say out of the mouth comes what is in the heart. So we must fill our hearts with wisdom. So who is it that you're putting into your heart? Is it Christ or is it the world? We all need a spiritual father or mother to help us. I've had many mentors over the years. And it's been worth it. Yeah, I've invested a lot of time and energy that could have been spent with Emily. It could have been spent with the kids. But I understand that through this there was a growth that was a necessity. We need this. So again, I encourage you, as much as I can, I exhort you, find someone to be that spiritual partner in this life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your words of wisdom throughout all of Scripture. Lord, we thank you for your, uh, your patience that you have with us, Lord, as we as we seek to live this life out, and we do so imperfectly, Lord. But I also, I celebrate the fact that in your wisdom, you've chosen us, even in our imperfection, to carry forth the gospel, Lord. You do not require or expect perfection. Or discipleship does not mean that we have to have mastered and arrived and that we've become some sort of spiritual giant, Lord. No, it is through the journeys of life, life on life with others, that we see growth happen, Lord. And we, we acknowledge that your word is absolutely crystal clear, that it is our responsibility not only to receive the word, but to act upon it in ways that will uh, be fruitful for the beneficial uh, of, of needs within the body, but also for building up the church. So Lord, help us to be faithful in that way. 
Help us to focus on our impact each and every day within our church community, but also our community at large. I pray your blessing on this uh, meeting uh, and the rest of the day. In your name we pray. Amen. Please stand for the benediction and then we'll have a closing song again. Uh, if you are able, please stay and I will go back and grab copies of the agenda. It will be a brief meeting. We just want to inform you of what's coming, but please stick around for a little bit. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Remember, church, you are leaving this place today because you are sent.